who didn't know this guy. We had no idea what he was up to, and honestly, it made us angry, and we thought he was full of himself, full of pride. What am I talking about? Running, a, I was running a road race. Uh, it was a half marathon or full marathon, and I had still had several miles to go before the finish line. And here is this guy who, by his appearance and his look, it was obvious that he was one of the elite guys. He was one of the elite runners. He was running back toward us on the course. And instantly, you know, those around started being like, what's this guy doing? Trying to show us up. And we felt embarrassed by it. We felt angry by it because he seemed to be, i uh, just get a few extra miles here after getting my 26.2 run in, right? But that's not at all what he was doing. Later on, I saw what, what had happened. He had finished his race, and then he was coming back to find a friend who obviously was a much slower runner to coach him and encourage him to get him to the finish line. Well, that illustration is what we have today in our text. We have the Apostle Paul who is nearing the end of his ministry in his life. He is very, very close to being put to death for his faith. And he is instilling in Timothy, he's coaching Timothy, he's encouraging Timothy to finish strong. And in fact, Paul even says, look at my life. He says, follow me. Is this egotism? No, not at all. Paul was giving Timothy the wisdom and the confidence he needed to be the pastor he was called to be and to not be timid and run over by the false teachers, but to be firm in his calling for God. So let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're just going to look at four verses today, verses 10 through 13. Originally, this was going to go a longer section, but I broke it up. And so verses 10 through 13, so Paul writes to Timothy, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted." While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Let's pray. Father God, these are your words of truth, and upon them we build our lives. We know from experience, we know from just looking back through our lives when we tried to take matters in our own hands and live by our standard and not by yours, we know how that worked out for us, God, and remind us. Even if today is, is beautiful for us and everything is going fine, God, remind us of the value of your word and the strength that we need from it. And God, for those who are in the midst of persecution and suffering, maybe not being persecuted for their faith, but they feel suffering, God, I pray that you encourage them through the scripture. God, help them to see your glory and your greatness and be able to put their their situation and problems into perspective today and find your presence real. In your name we pray. Amen. So in our passage last week, we saw these false teachers who were causing all this chaos and destruction in the church there at Ephesus. And in fact, it wasn't just the false teachers. They were influencing other people. And Paul's description of these people were they were just lovers of themselves. They were lovers of pleasure. And so they did these things. Instead of loving God, they loved themselves. And Paul pointed out that these people on the facade, on the outside, they spoke a good talk. They could talk about God. They could talk about Jesus. But it was all external. It was just a show. There was nothing truly real there, no power to them because there was no transformation. So the power was there was no sanctification, no growing to become more like Christ. There was no real desire for holiness in their life. And so from our study of First and Second Timothy, we can definitely conclude that young Pastor Timothy has been timid and possibly reluctant to deal with these false teachers and these people who were causing this, these troubles in Ephesus. So today, Paul clearly contrasts his life, Paul's life, with those of the false teachers, those who were causing the trouble, those who were lovers of themselves. And Paul says, I'm the example, Timothy, that you need to continue to follow. So look at verse 10. He says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, 
my love and my steadfastness. I love that. Paul just puts his life out there front and center. He, and Timothy knows him well. Timothy, you know, this is not somebody writing to Timothy who Paul and this know, uh, Timothy knows a little bit about. Timothy knows Paul well. Timothy was brought to the faith more than likely by Paul and mentored and discipled by Paul. So he knew Paul very, very well. And he says, Paul says, I have nothing to hide. And I love that because it's a great principle for every one of us in here today. Hear this. Godly people have nothing to hide. Godly people have nothing to hide. The church needs people of integrity. The church needs people who are willing to open up their lives for the good of others. Why do people hide? We know it's true. We know we've been guilty of that ourselves, of hiding ourselves, our brokenness, and thinking that that's better for the community of believers, it's more protection for us. Why do we do that? Because we deceive ourselves and we fail to understand the gospel. We fail to understand the cross. You see, Jesus didn't come because we were a little broken. If, if we were just a little bit messed up, but we were fairly moral people, would Jesus, God's son, have to come and die in our place? I mean, Jesus, God could have sent, you know, I'm going to send an angel down to be the sacrifice for your sins. That'll take care of it because you guys are not that bad down there, you know. But that's not the case, is it? I mean, Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth to die for sinners because we're all broken. And so a failure to understand the cross and each of our deep, dark, inherent sinfulness, it, that will convince you and I that we need to hide, that we need to cower. We need to be scared. We don't need to open our life. But here, here's the gospel. Get this. The gospel declares that there is nothing that could ever be uncovered about you and me that hasn't already been covered by Jesus Christ. If you're in Christ, there is no condemnation. So there's nothing that you need to hide because Jesus' blood covers it all. And so godly people can live with their life wide open because they realize that they are broken. And they're humbled and they're fighting their sin. They're pursuing Jesus. And, and, and you know, if you just need a practical illustration of that, if you're thinking, well, I can't really minister or I can't really build into people's lives or I can't really make a difference because I don't have it all together. I want you to think about this for a second. I want you to think about the 12 disciples. Jesus continually chastised them for their weak faith. He got on to them because they tried to get rid of kids who came to see Jesus. Are you that bad yet, right? Kids, get out of here. We don't want you around, right? But th they did that. They literally didn't want kids coming to Jesus. They thought it was in a good use of his time. They argued about who was the greatest, all right? Our elders don't sit around going, I'm the greatest. No, I am. I mean, we don't do that, do we? I hope not, right? The deacons, we don't do that. Church members, we don't, we're not that bold to say, I'm better than them, verbally anyway. The disciples did that. Peter denied Jesus. At the cross, all his disciples abandoned and deserted him. And they directly disobeyed Jesus when he told them to wait in Jerusalem. Instead, they go back to the Sea of Galilee, and they return to their fishing business. Yet Jesus, seeing all these things and knowing all these things and knowing ahead of time what would happen, he still commissioned them out to ministry, did he not? He still sent them out two by two to go into the villages and to share the good news. And so I'm telling you, it's not an excuse for you today to think because you don't have it all together that you can't be investing in somebody else's life. Jesus, if he saved you, and if you're digging in and, and realizing what the gospel has done in your life, then warts and all, which we all have, you can be sharing and loving other people by allowing your life to be wide open. And in fact, Paul himself, even though we read here in this, in this passage, Paul saying, follow all these things about me, Paul also was fully transparent about his struggles. In Romans chapter 7, is this a guy who's writing, who's full of pride and full of ego? I don't think so. Look what he says. For I delight in the law of God in my inner person, but I see in my members, which is another word for just his body, my body another law waging war against the law that's in my mind, making me a captive to the law of sin that dwells in my body. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death that has me just frustrated and held captive? And then he says, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ 
He can and he does. He goes to the gospel. He points to Jesus. And in seeing Jesus, he understands that the grace is there for him to serve God. Imperfections and all. And remember this. No one, no one gives grace better than those who are aware of their own need for grace. And so if you want to make an impact, if you want to live your life wide open for Jesus Christ, the more that you are in touch with your own sinfulness and the grace that God has shed on you and given to you and continues to give to you, the more grace you're going to show for other people. You're not going to be shocked or surprised by that revelation that guy says or what that woman tells you. You're going to realize but for the grace of God, there am I exactly. In other areas of my life, I am there. And so we need to live with our lives open. I was reading in an old commentary this, this past week in 2 Timothy, and he said this. He said, where are the older men or the more mature believers in the church? What are they doing with their life? Are they only serving on boards or are they making disciples? Ouch, right? Ouch. You don't outgrow disciple-making. And Kevin DeYoung says this. He says, the one indispensable requirement for producing godly, mature Christians is godly, mature Christians. If we want to produce godly, mature Christians, be a godly, mature Christian. And so we need those who are willing to embrace the gospel and to live life wide open. And again, Paul had nothing to hide in Philippians. Again, he's not full of himself. He's not full of pride. In Philippians, he says, not that I've already attained this or am already perfect. I'm not arrived, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ has made me his own. So he's pressing hard to Jesus, and he's not letting his pride hold him back. And we should not let our pride hold us back from living life open. And so he says, Timothy, examine my life. As I follow Jesus, Timothy, follow my life, follow my example. And look what the first thing that Paul points to in this list. He points to his teaching. Because godly people are passionate about teaching the truth. Godly people are passionate about the truth. So Paul lists that first. He says, you have followed my teaching. And teaching is critical. We don't just get lazy or or, or kind of open-minded to the point where we think truth is sort of, you know, we can just take it or or leave it. We understand it is critical, and Grace Church constantly reiterates this again and again, that we love the Bible, that we read the Bible, we study the Bible, that it's not just left for the pastors or the elders to tell you the Bible, but each one of you should be in the Scripture yourself studying it. Every person should be a student of the Bible. Why? Because the gospel we preach will dictate the result of our discipleship. The gospel that we preach, the content of what we preach, determines the kind of people that watch us and what they do and how they follow us. So what gospel is your life preaching? What gospel is your word preaching? And you may think, well, I don't get that. I don't understand, like, what kind of different gospels are you talking about here? Let me, let me just name you a few, and, and I found a great chart and sort of amended it for my benefit here to make it a little more clear. But I grew up with a gospel of what I'm going to call forgiveness, a gospel of forgiveness. I think he's going to put the chart up there, a gospel of forgiveness. What is that? It was it just basically, I, I just need to get out of hell, okay? I just need to, to escape hell. And so, therefore, it was optional whether I continued to pursue Jesus and become like Jesus because the goal of my, the gospel that I heard was simply to escape hell and to get to heaven. And so many of you were probably led to believe that was the gospel, was just get out of hell and go to heaven. There's also those who have been raised in churches where it's a liberal gospel. Basically, it is all about the poor and the oppressed. It's all about you know, just, just serving other people and ministering to other people, but it's void of any kind of absolute truth. Absolute truth is missing in this gospel. Then others, they grew up maybe in a, in a prosperity sort of gospel, which says, claim your right, you're a child of the king. And so claim your right. God wants to just lavish you with materialism and gifts. So just name it and claim it. And in that, you produce disciples that are full of entitlement. And when suffering happens, people are like, whoa, what is that about? I, God, I must be sinning because God surely wouldn't bring suffering into my life because he's just all about good stuff. Then you have those who 
are about the religious right. Those who think that the gospel basically is to force changing in our society. And there's constant words and languages that tie in our country and the constitution and the gospel. And we just got to be cultural warriors and we got to get culture right. But here's the problem. All these have some partial truth to them. But here's the problem with that. It doesn't change people's hearts. It doesn't change the heart of the unbeliever. So if that's your gospel, if that's a constant thing that you're pounding and sounding in your life, nobody's being drawn to Jesus. They're just thinking, well, i got to vote smarter, right? i got to know the issues better. But there's no heart there that is for passionate for Jesus. But the gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of grace, the gospel that looks at Jesus, and it's all about Jesus. And I want to follow Jesus, and God has lavished his grace upon me. And grace upon grace upon grace. And in that, are we produced disciples who are humble, who are broken. Those who know that the gospel is what has to change people's hearts. And those who want to look at Jesus' life and live like Jesus lived. That's the gospel that we want to preach. Not just with our words, but with our lives. With our attitudes. With everything we do. So every true Christian must possess a robust and ever-growing passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not something that you just check off your list when you come to Jesus. I got the gospel, and now I'm ready to move on to other things. Look what Peter says in 2 Peter 3.18. We grow, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's talking to believers here. Just keep growing in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we grow in this grace, we'll see that our love for Jesus and our love for other people is proportional to our understanding of grace. Our love for people and our love for grace will be proportional to our understanding of the gospel and the gospel of grace. So the more that you see, practically speaking, the more that you see, I'm a sinner, deserving of hell, but God, reach down and save me. That's going to change your viewpoint, the world that you deal with. So we reflect upon the gospel. We talk about preaching the gospel to ourselves. When we wake up in the morning, I said a few weeks ago, pray the gospel. Before you get to fix this and do this and make this right and keep him safe, before we get to those things in our prayer list, we should be praying the gospel and preaching the gospel to ourselves, realizing every day that I'm accepted by God. I can enter God's presence not because of something I did, but because of what Jesus did on my behalf. Even that is a gift of grace that I can come to Jesus in prayer. And so we're never content with our grasp of grace. Now, those who may be in here today, and you may be a bit of a skeptic, and you think, well, I don't understand, you know, Paul and his gospel and all this talk. You know, know, Paul really wasn't even a disciple. Did he even really know Jesus? Like, Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament Can we trust Paul? You know, what's he saying here? I want to go to Galatians chapter 1. It'll be on the screen for you because I think this is important to realize that Paul just wasn't writing this stuff on the the fly as liberal commentators and people will tell you. He writes in Galatians 1, 11 through 12, he says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul says, this isn't my gospel. This is the gospel of Jesus. And a lot of people, and some of you, this may be not relevant to you, but, but stay with me. Some of you will appreciate this. Some people want to separate Jesus and Paul, and they want to divide there and say there's a gospel of Jesus, and then there's a gospel of Paul. It's the same gospel. It's the same gospel. And next week we'll look more into that, uh, and, and we'll study that more deeply. But Godly people have nothing to hide was our first point. Second point, godly people are passionate about the truth. And then the third point, which really ties in all with all these other was, others, is God, godly people practice what they preach. Godly people practice what they preach. Look what he says next. After he says, Timothy, you follow my teaching. Now what does he say? He says, my conduct. Paul's school of doctrine was not given and taught in a classroom. Paul's school of doctrine was taught as he went along the way. He was grabbing these guys, sharing Christ, winning them to Christ, and then he was saying, let me teach you. Watch me. Let me open my life up. Watch me as I go. 
Discipleship wasn't just, let me take a bunch of information and impart it to you. It was saying, watch me, because there's coming a day when you're going to be doing this. So watch me do it. Now I'm going to come alongside of you, and I'm going to do it with you. And now I'm going to turn you loose, and I'm going to watch you as you do it. And then I'm going to turn you loose, Timothy, to run with it yourself. And there's a lot of opposition. There's a lot of suffering. But Timothy, you're ready, you're prepared, because God has given you a gift to do this. And so he says, we need to model our theology. We live our theology. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. He says, we loved you, the Thessalonians, so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives also. He said, not only did I open up the good news, I opened up my life to you. You see why Jesus is called to come and die. And when Paul said in Romans 12 that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice and we think about baptism and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and I'm dead to myself. You see why this stuff is meaningful? Because a follower of Jesus must constantly say, if I open my life up to other people, that means I lose this or I give up this or I don't have as much time for this. You see, there's a sacrifice that's involved in living out the gospel and practicing what you preach. It impedes on your comfort. It impedes upon your idols. And so the word of God speaks to us not to just believe something, but to embrace it. And that's what baptism shows. It shows that I'm embracing Jesus, that the old life is gone. The new life has begun. But I'm afraid that we've made salvation into the first point that I said on the gospel, just got my forgiveness, then now optional whether I do my holiness. I'm going to heaven, right? I mean, that's, I'm safe. We, we think that's the gospel, and we miss the gospel. The gospel is Jesus changes us. He transforms us. And so we open up our lives through discipleship. We open up our lives through things like marriage mentoring. We've been training marriage mentors here at Grace for a few months now. And look, marriages are hurting. The kids are coming in because we're going to do another baptism in a minute, and I wanted them to be able to see uh, Skyla be baptized. It's a great encouragement to them, and so they're going to sit back there quietly and listen. But marriage mentoring, get this, even if you're passionate, married people, if you're passionate about Jesus, your marriage can only be as strong as the weakest person in your relationship. And so you're going to be frustrated and you're going to be beating your head against the wall. You're like, I don't understand why you won't come with me. I don't understand why she won't do that. And it's frustrating because your sanctification is being stifled because of your relationship with your spouse and you're unwilling to maybe step up and do something about it. And marriage mentoring is the perfect example of opening up not only the word, but opening up one's life. And so we have couples that are trained to open up their lives and say, come join us. We're going to show you the imperfections of our own life in marriage. We're, we're maybe down the road a little bit further than you are, and so we're going to show you some of the mistakes we made and the things that happened in our marriage, and we're going to just open it up for you to see. But we know that this is what God wants us to do so you can walk and live out the mission that God has called you to live, not just to improve your marriage so you can be happier. It's to glorify Jesus As Christ loved the church, we love our wives. It's a picture to the world. And so when you're dysfunctional in your marriage and you're not, you don't even enjoy being around the person, you're arguing and fighting and it's terrible, what's that say to the world about Jesus and his church? It says it's dysfunctional. That's a bad picture of Jesus and his church. And so I hope you'll respond in the app. There's an opportunity to respond to the, the marriage mentoring, and you can sign up if you want to be a mentor. We'd love to have you join and go through the training. It's a great option for many of you to do that. Um, we're going to fully roll this out in a, in a few weeks, but I wanted to go ahead and put a great plug in for it today because it's such a, a good thing, and some of us have already started doing it. So Paul says, follow me. Look what he says. He says, follow my, my conduct. He says, follow my aim in life. He says, follow my faith. Follow my patience. Follow my love. Follow my steadfastness, my endurance. So Paul says, look at these things in my life, and I want you to follow these things. Godly people open up their life. Godly people know the word. They're growing in the word. They love the word. 
Godly people are living out what they say. They're practicing what they preach. And there's this godliness. And, and I love this quote by David Palestine because he, he really says in a very practical way what it means to be godly and holy because sometimes we can make it kind of up there like a godly person and I can never achieve that. He says, becoming more holy does not mean that you have become ghostly, detached from the storms of life, ethereal. He says, it means you're becoming a wiser human being. You are learning how to deal biblically with your money, your sexuality, your job. You're becoming a better friend and a better family member. When you talk, the words communicate more good sense, more joy, more reality. You are learning to pray honestly, bringing who God really is to the reality of human need. I love that. Just a really, really down-to-earth definition. Godliness. God created all of us to glorify him and to rightly represent him. And we do that by being holy as God is holy. And look where Paul leads Timothy next in following. He says, verse 10, he said, you, you have followed me. And then he says in verse 11, you followed me in these ways. My persecutions, my sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and at Lystra. So what he's telling Timothy, he says, godly people aren't afraid of persecution, Timothy. And, you know, and, and it would be nice to leave off this fourth point, right, and just kind of be done with the first three and be like, okay, I can do that. But when we kind of get to this point, our natural reaction is, whoa, hold on for a second. Persecution, suffering, now that sounds serious business. And I love the fact that the, the illustrations, the, the places of persecution that Paul points out here, Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, these were places that were very close to Timothy's hometown. He's doing something here. He's pointing, because he, he could have pulled from many, many examples, but he pulls from these specifically because apparently these had a pretty big impact on Timothy. They made a big impression on him because they're right there at his zip code where he lived. And so he points to Timothy, he said, these things happened to me. And he's going to say in the next verse, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. None of us like to suffer. It wouldn't be normal if we liked to suffer. But at the same time, we need to realize that God uses suffering in a way that produces something in us that nothing else can. Think about, you, you are godly mature in your faith. Think through some of the hardest things that you've encountered in your life over the years. Think about it right now. Those were defining moments, weren't they? I think of even last week in the membership class, Johnny sharing about when Brenda had cancer and how that changed the trajectory of his life. Many of you can think of these things. We don't ask God, bring them, God. I'm ready, bring them on. We don't ask that, but we know those things happen. And it wouldn't be a Sunday sermon if I didn't quote from Paul Tripp. He just says so many good things, and I'm reading them every day in New Morning Mercies. And he says, remind yourself that the painful things we deal with are not some bad accident, horrible luck, or indication of a massive failure of God's plan. God leaves us in this broken world because it produces in us a way, a way better than the comfortable life we all want. God is giving us something through the things, uh, though the things uh, we're, we're, I'm going to try that again. God is giving us something through the things that we are going through that we would not have experienced without the suffering. We would not have experienced without the suffering. Suffering exposes the things that we look to as idols. It shows us our self-reliance. It causes us to depend upon God like nothing else does. And so Paul says, God delivered me from all these. He rescued me from me. But, but Paul knew the, the, this was coming, his, the end of his life, that God's rescue, he was faithful, but there was coming a time when he would be put to death for his faith. And he says in Philippians, I'm hard-pressed between the two, between staying here or going to be with Jesus. He says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. So the point there is Timothy needs to realize that God delivers, but ultimately, we're looking for the total deliverance. And so when we realize that, the Scripture says that man can hurt the body, but they can't touch the soul. That we see suffering different. We see persecution different because our great reward is Jesus. And so godly men and women 
go through suffering, and yes, we're tempted to question God's goodness, His wisdom, His grace. All of us are. I don't care how mature you are in the faith, you question that at times or consider it at times. God, do you, do you know what you're going, doing here? God, is this your plan? God, I don't understand this. We question at times. The Psalms are full of the psalmist questioning the situation they're in, but they always reach the conclusion at the end that God is sovereign, He's faithful, and He knows what He's doing, and He's in control. And so we may struggle to accept what God's doing, but the more we just give our hearts to God and say, God, you're in control. You're sovereign. You created me. You're doing something here. It's your story, not my story. And sure, it hurts, but it gives us meaning and purpose, and we know it's bigger than us. And so he says in verse 12, Indeed, all, everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's not just for the super apostles. It's not just for preachers. Everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jonathan Edwards, the famous preacher from the past, said, though there are, though there are not very many believers standing in line to claim this promise, it is nevertheless a sure promise from God's word that all who want to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So do you want to be a godly person? Expect persecution. Do you want to live for him? Know there's going to be tension. There's going to be pushback. And we know that's the truth in our day and age we live in. It's happening on the college campuses. It's happening in schools. It's happening in hospitals. It's happening through the adoption process. It's happening in all these areas of life where persecution's coming at Christians and saying, if you believe this, then you can't have that or you can't do that. Campus ministries are being thrown off college campuses, state college campuses, because they can't preach against sin. We're coming to the day where persecution isn't just something of a third world country. It's happening here in America. And most of us have not experienced real persecution for our faith, but we definitely experience suffering, and we suffer. And we understand that that is part of being a believer, and God's doing something. And so as we face these things, have the realization, what he says in verse 13, that evil people, imposters, they're going to go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's not getting any better. Last week he said, we're in the last days, Timothy. He says, people are going to get worse and worse. It's going to be where you're going to be more and more persecuted, Timothy, for your faith. And we can expect that as well. In fact, and this is not to bum you out, This is to be an encouragement. A new Gallup poll that just came out said the number of Americans now affiliated with a church is just 47%. And really what's significant about that number, that low number, is the speed of the plummet. It was 68% 20 years ago and 47% now. Things are changing. How are you going to look at it? What's going to be your attitude? We're all going to struggle. Just like you struggle in suffering, God, what are you doing? You're going to look at the world and you're going to say, God, are you in control of this thing? And I I ditched my Facebook account, thank God. That was the best decision I ever made. I still have my Twitter. It's got to go next because I I read that stuff and I just get angry. And and I want to become a cultural warrior. I I want to just blast and tell those those non-believers what they're doing to this country. Right? It's in all of us. We get mad. Our flesh says, I hate those communists. Right? They're taking our country away. But what does Jesus say? i got to look at the gospel. The gospel says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. That's Jesus. Jesus said that. And so, do you think my attitude is justified in being angry? Absolutely not. I'm a Jesus follower. The gospel is what I follow. And the gospel says, Jesus said in his prayer, as he left this earth, he he told us, he prayed for us. He said, by your love for one another, they're going to know that you're my disciples. I've left you in this world to be a light to this world. 
a light in darkness. And it's through our growing as godly people and our loving the gospel and living out the gospel and allowing the gospel to transform us. I believe that is where we're going to see people's lives changed. I'm not sure about the culture, honestly. And there's no promises for the culture in Scripture. But there's promises that we can be light and we can be salt to the individuals and people we come in contact with. And so I don't think the right attitude for us is to get, to get angry and mad at people. We can be hurt in righteous anger, for sure. But you know the kind of anger I'm talking about, the kind of anger that you just want to put them in their place and show them they're wrong and humiliate them. That's the anger that comes from Satan and the flesh. God says, love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. And the methods of the flesh have not done much, right, to stop our spiritual decline that we're in. In fact, things are just picking up speed. I think we need to go back to the gospel. Go back to what God has called us to in the beginning. A light in the darkness. Understanding that persecution is happening and is coming. We're faithful in suffering. Our endurance, our love, our faith shine forth in those times when the bad is coming at us full force. That's what God has called us to do in Jesus. That's the gospel. And so our head, our heart, and our hands. Godly people reproduce godly people. Right? Godly people reproduce godly people. Look at your kids. I know there's exceptions, right? But look at our kids. They're our closest disciples. What are they becoming like? Are they angry? Are they bitter? Or are they embracing the gospel? We know that they have their own minds they can make their own decisions. They can go their own way. We know that's the case. But are you being diligent in your discipleship at home? Are you trying to invest your godliness into them? And in the heart, pray for God to move your heart to love people more. And then practically in your, your hands, invest your life in a few for the gospel. Invest your life in a few for the gospel. Pray, God, who would you have me to be sharing life with. Like Josh said, K-groups, Fight Club. He's got people in his life who are building into him. Who's on your list? Who are you building into? What marriage are you and your spouse reaching out to and trying to encourage for the gospel? Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus. Let's make a difference in this world for him.